Hey! How you doing? Boy, what a busy day, huh? I'm going to give a lecture next week down in uh, Naples, uh, Florida. I'll be gone for five days. Um, what's the thing which is closest to the ether? Yeah? That would be two terms. A field and energy. So, talk about defining the ether. <laughs> There's no branch of science that's ever defined what a field is or energy. Someone will say, sure they have. You look at Wikipedia. It was the energy is the ability to do work. Yeah. Well, that's descriptive. And descriptions are not explanations. Yeah. So it doesn't define energy. And there have been a few goofy videos recently. A lot of people actually asked me to define the ether. First, we have to start off with talking about an axiom of metaphysics that's extremely ancient. It belongs to both the Greeks and the Indians. Yep, of course, India didn't exist back then, I know. And uh, it's this premise in uh, ancient uh, Pali and Sanskrit, it's uh, the asti versus nasti. This means there is, and the other one means there is not. See, so you're positing something here, and you're negating something there but you're making declarative objective statements about something that you can't make objective declarative statements about. So a lot of people say, what is the ether? The other one is, uh, what's the ether made of? And I know someone's going to actually be more than one person. We'll actually write in this video, say, oh, the Michaels and Morley experiment disproved the ether. It actually did no such thing. It gone into the particulars of the so-called Michelson Morley experiments many countless times over many years. Uh, that's not uh, any dismissal of the ether in any way, shape, or form. Not only that, the experiment itself is extremely crude and it makes suppositions about the ether such that when they did the experiment they said, well, this will either prove it or disprove it. Nothing can ever disprove the ether. And might I remind you, and this is incredibly important, and people don't get the importance of this, there's ever throughout the entirety of history only been two postulates as the foundation of reality. One's been upon bumping particles, yeah, atomism specifically. And the religion of atomism is the realm of mathematicians. Today, scientists are not scientists, they're actually mathematicians. And the other one's been the ether. You can't explain the universe with bumping particles. You can't explain instantaneous action at a distance with particles. You can't ever explain what a field is with particles. These people think that even light's a particle. They even came up with a sound particle. Believe it or not, don't take my word for it, go look it up, called the phonon, which is completely ridiculous. By the way, in ancient history, both Greek, Indian, and Egyptian, there was literally well over a thousand different ideas on or about the ether. So when someone says, well, the ancient Greeks said the ether was, well, that's a highly ignorant statement because the ancient Greeks made many, many countless declarative statements depending on which school of thought. The Stoics, the Materialists, the Epicureans, the Platonists, on and on and on and on. So, is the ether. It is is an objective Cartesian phenomena that we can make declarative statements about something with mass and magnitude that has volume and or weight. I can make a declarative statement about something that is. This is a rock, by the way. Declarative statement about something that is, meaning objective, but you can't make any declarative objective statements about the ether. Does this mean you can't talk about it? No, that's not the case. It means, and this is where retroduction actually comes in, and yes, I'm still working on the booklet on retroduction, make understanding uh, retroductive analysis of something that has no objective presence. And this is no different than talking about a signal. People say, well, a signal is EMP. It has a certain fre frequency and wavelength. But in the case of the radio, and once again, the two things that are closest to the ether is the term field and the term energy. And I assure you, you can go look this up. If you want to have a debate with me about it, let's go ahead. I'm all game for that. And they've never 
define the term energy. They've never defined the term field. I'll tell you what a field is. It's really simple. A field is an ether perturbation modality. Just like ice, water, and steam are different temperature and pressure modalities of water expressions or phenomenal expressions of something. So. so we can't say the ether is making an objective declarative statement about something that has mass and magnitude with a Cartesian vector. Well, it's this long and this is the width and this is the depth and it has X mass on and on and on. So you can't, this is like someone foolishly trying to measure the measurer, you know. I'll remind people, too, that the things that have built the foundation of this entire reality throughout ancient civilization to today are built upon things that nobody can see, nobody can hold, nobody can measure, nobody can lay their hands on, like love, faith, hope, fear, anger, on and on. There is nobody on this earth that can deny all of civilization is built upon, built upon these principles. You know, someone would laugh away the ether, and there are many that have, including some recent videos from some extremely unintelligent people, and there are so many. Yeah. No one goes looking after things that they think they know the answer to. Well, if I can't hold the ether or see it or smell it or taste it or touch it or measure it, it can't exist. So you don't love your mothers? Like, what are you talking about? Well, you know, you can't see it or smell it or taste it or touch it. It's not an object. It doesn't have length, width, or depth. It has no Cartesian phenomena within the objective universe. Yet, once again, the entirety of this world has been built upon things that have none of those properties. Love, faith, hope, fear, anger, uh, you know, on and on and on and on. And that, of course, is 100% undeniable. So we can't say that the ether is. We can't make declarative statements that people always ask, so what's the ether made of? If the ether were made of, that it would be constituent composite parts, and it would be complete refutation of the ether by definition. So I have to ask you what the question uh, to be posited is. What's the definition of rest regarding energy? And human beings always see things upside down and backwards. They think of energy, and so do you, like a giant mushroom cloud, in the case of like a fissionable core of uranium or plutonium. Oh, look at that. That's the impotency of energy. That's the release of energy. What does pure rest look like? We have to engage the retroductive uh, Pythagorean methodology to come to an understanding, to understand what a field is, to understand what energy is, what is rest. Walter Russell understood this quite well. I don't agree with everything Walter Russell said, but I certainly you know, uh, scanned in and digitized his works for the whole world. You're welcome to have access to. And he understood rest really well. He even made a lot of diagrams about rest. People say, well, if you can't draw the ether and you can't point to it, it doesn't exist. Well, I could say the same thing regarding your love for your child or the love for your wife or your mother. You know, you can't draw it, and you can't point to it, and you can't weigh it, and you can't see it and smell it. and take. So that is a pedestrian argument by pseudo-intellectuals, specifically by materialists. We actually have to go way beyond something that gross, that base, that profane and uh, materialistic. So, And also, two people make declarative statements that space is the ether. This has been done by many pseudo-philosophers and pseudo-intellectuals throughout the, the eons, but not only is space not the ether, it is the complete opposite of ether. Ether is pure potential, non-Cartesian pure potential. Space is pure impotency. What's the opposite of pure potential? Isn't the opposite of pure potential pure impotency? That is the case. That's not my opinion or feeling or belief. That's undeniably the case. Space is pure impotency of potential. Space is, of course, the shadow of the ether. Space is no different than a shadow. It's the absence of something that is rest and pure and subjective. It has no principality. Space is... Nikola Tesla, the only time Nikola Tesla loses his cool is attacking the relativistic ideas of the reification or propping up of the principle a space, which doesn't have any properties. It has attributes, but not properties. So space is the shadow of the ether. It's boundless impotency in the measure whereby which masses are, of course, measured. One thing I will agree with on every scientist's front is that every atom, they will say, is 99.99999% empty space. Well, it's empty, but it's just a magnetodielectric dynamo. But that's true. In other words, uh, the actual... Uh, 
uh, palpable, demonstrable matter of uh, the Earth. They say if you actually remove out the inner atomic uh, volume measured in picometers of every atom, the entire Earth would be reduced down to about this size, and that seems to be pretty accurate. Every atom is, this of course is where we get into the holographic universe, of course, but I'm not interested in discussing the holographic universe, as I've already done, though. But these people never defined a field. They've never defined energy. I already told you what a field is. It's an ether perturbation modality. Um, Nikola Tesla tells you about uh, this, and he doesn't talk about the ether much. He says, light is a sound wave in the ether. All of relativity and quantum, by the way, I will point out to you, and it's so very important, if you can't wrap your brain around this, you don't understand anything. It's based upon their understanding of light. Nothing emits sound. When I'm talking, I'm not emitting anything. I'm creating a disturbance through the release of energy, expenditure of calories to vibrate the medium, i.e. oxygen and nitrogen, which of course vibrates the microphone, diaphragm. Light is no different than this. Light is not a mission, a wave, a wave particle duality. It doesn't have a speed. That's the rate of induction to hysteresis of the medium as against itself, no different than the so-called speed of sound. But humans are incredibly, uh, you know, intellectually stunted in understanding this. But all of uh, quantum and relativity is based upon their understanding of light. Uh, here's a quote from James Clerk Maxwell. The medium of propagation, the ether, must exist. The medium must be a prominent thought in our investigations. That's from his Treatise on Electricity and Magnetism. This is James Kirk Maxwell, Treatise on Electricity and Magnetism, Volume 2. This appears to be in the minds of these uh, eminent men, some prejudice or prior object against the hypothesis of a medium, the ether, in which the phenomena of light and electrical actions and distance, uh, meaning action at a distance, take place. The existence of this medium which in uh, light is propagated, just as Nikola Tesla said, light is a sound wave in ether. Not an emission, rather a disturbance of the medium. Nobody can deny the ether. And once again, so, so importantly, never ever been any foundation in this entire history of the world, ever, other than materialism, bumping atoms, or I call it the cult of bumping particles, and that of the ether. There's only ever been those two. There's never been a third or a fourth or a fifth, only those two. This one's completely impossible, illogical, irrational, and insane. And this one is hyperlogical, rational, and it actually explains all observed phenomena. Yada, 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 I don't need the whole quote uh, from him. It goes by different names. By the way, the word ether is... Uh, like yelling out uh, uh, the devil in the middle of a church service. I mean, literally, it's that bad. They will tell you, and uh, this is from a particle physicist, we don't use the word ether because it's taboo. Instead, we call it vacuum energy. These are other things that and Mother Nature doesn't care what you call it. Human naming conceptions are irrelevant in the scheme of the universe, of course. It's called quantum vacuum, quantum foam, dark matter, dark energy, subspace, zero-point energy, the ether. It doesn't matter what you call it. It is all in reference to one and the same thing. And even saying thing is incorrect because thing refers to a phenomena with mass and magnitude and shape and measure and a beginning in time and an end in time. It is the complete antithesis of that. You want a, the real definition, of course, once again, the entire force geometry of the universe is the torus, as I've pointed out a million times. Here is the inverse of that. This is the geometry of uh, inertia and acceleration and of dielectricity. And of the ether, this would be the dielectric globe over here. This is a hyperbolate or an hourglass shape. The ether would be this non-Cartesian locus right here, which has no, uh, you know, no... Uh, Phenomena, no value, no footprint in the universe. We can't say it is, we can't say it is not. Pure, non-Cartesian potential. Energy by definition. And once again, it is no coincidence that no branch of science has even defined the two things that are closest to that, the, uh, that go around, basically. Our modality expressions in speaking thereof, the closest things to the ether being Energy and a field. Everything is field, and fields are not particles. But no branch of science has ever defined the term field. So, once again, he says, yeah, we don't use the word ether because it's taboo. Non-Cartesian counterspatial inertia. The essence, of course, of all field modalities. Nobody can have a dialectic, that's a great word nobody uses anymore, dialectic discussion and uh, hermeneutical analysis of the non-Cartesian, 
pure potential phenomena of something that just like nobody denies love and fear and hope and uh, desire and hate which has built the entire world it's like can you see it or smell it or touch it or lay your hands on it no you cannot is it important yes it is you're not going to deny the love i have for my mother or my little children well, I mean, can you show me that love or feel it or touch it or, you know, no, I cannot. I can show it to you. So, oh, I don't believe you love your kids then. How dare you? People will fight over that. But they'll say, well, you're right. I don't think the ether exists because you can't hold it or smell it or taste it or touch it or measure it and feel it. <laughs> it has no objective phenomenal value. You know, with a length, width, and a depth, and a mass, and a magnitude, and a temporal measure, which is what time is, a measure. You see the illogical, irrational uh, inconsistencies thereof in people's thinking analysis? They'll uphold, like, love and fear and hope but they'll reject the ether for the same principles that it has uh, as any emotion or any field. Fields are not in denial, but no branch of science ever defined a field. No branch of science denies fields, but they can't, they've never defined it. The same is true of the ether, but oh, they reject the ether. That's right. I can't analyze under a microscope love and faith and hope and fear. These, these pseudo-intellectuals, these, these a bunch of dogs that are sniffing each other's uh, uh, dirty sphincters are in a circle, and they think they're so smart. Yeah, fields exist, yeah, but the ether does not. Well, the ether is a field modality. Yeah, it's a dirty word. We can't use it. It's a taboo word. We cannot, mm, no, we cannot discuss the ether. Once again, it's literally like crying out the devil in the middle of a church service. And I, I don't mean that humorously. I mean it quite literally. I think that's a taboo. They just renamed the ether. Quantum space, quantum foam, dark matter, dark energy, subspace, zero-point energy. <laughs> They're so inconsistent. So, we can't say the ether is because is regards phenomena and things of Cartesian value. Is the ether true? There is a true statement that we can make. Is the ether a substrate truth of the universe? And it would be the substrate truth of the universe regarding the cosmos uh, noitos, which is the underverse. There's a great word from a movie. It's kind of a brilliant word. The underverse. Remember that from the Riddick movies? Uh, the universe would be the phenomenal universe of things and junk and atoms and suns and matter, you know, it's the underverse. <laughs> it's kind of a brilliant word they invented for a movie. It kind of fits accurately. Um, but it is a reality. So, is the ether a truth of the universe as the substrate of the universe? And the answer is 1,000% yes, it is. But we can't uh, objectify it as so far as how humans like to wrap their objective little minds around things. You know, you can't both believe in love and faith and hope, the things that built this entire world, and at the same time, well, deny the ether because you can't hold it, smell it, taste it. I mean, it's just, that's just, that's irrational, it's hyperbolic, it's ludicrous. It's, it's hypocritical. It's, it's radically unintelligent. So what is the ether? Can't say the ether is or is not. Asti, nasti, in the ancient Pali. But it is the truth of the universe and the substrate of all phenomena. And all fields are just ether perturbation modalities. This is also too true and the truth of the universe. I hope this helped you in grasping the dialectic of discussing the ether. And uh, if you ever want to contact me, my email is in the description below. Have a lovely week. Lux Veritas.